Attendance is going, so if y'all want to check in, you can go ahead and check in. I also need this one. Okay, which slide was it going? Well, we have gotten almost to the very end of section two, right? We're talking about disaccharides. Yeah, we're really almost almost there. And that's it, I think. Oh, chilly in here today. I have my jacket ready for lab, but I didn't bring it to lecture. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be this chilly. Well, and yesterday it was hot when it was raining. The day before it was freezing. Isn't it supposed to rain again on day tomorrow? Oh, it's supposed to yeah. rain. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so check in on attendance. If you have not checked in on attendance, I'm so proud of you for coming out in the rain. Like it's not that big a deal, it's rain, come on. All right, um, so my reminder to you to fill out the evaluation if you have not done so already. Remember 70% is a five bonus point on the final exam. But you should really do it for all your classes. You know, it's kind of a good thing to do. All right. Um, and then I wanted to look real quick at our schedule, which is, oops, uh-oh, I unshared screen. Too many buttons too close together. All right, so um, we are right here, right? We have one week, and then the next week is what? Wait, where are we? Exam four, we're here. This was spring break. We are on the Friday. This is us. No, no, no. This is us. Then we have a week of class. The next week of class, we have our last exam. Then we have Monday and Wednesday. And look where our exam is. It's on Thursday. <laughs> I'm telling you to start studying. I'm telling you to start studying. <laughs> I'm just, just trying to give you all the information. <laughs> all right, and your joke for the day, um, what contest do skunks always win? The smelling bee. <laughs> You're just getting a chuckle out of no one chuckling. <laughs> all right. The Easter ones were pretty good. The Easter ones, were, well, we had we had gotten a lot of Easter ones that were not good. So I was able to filter it through and just give you the good ones, but you know. So, how do you recommend studying for like this long Because it's like a lot of It's cumulative. I know that. <laughs> how many records are on the final Um, no. <laughs> there, are, there are free response on the final or free response. Um, how many do we have to answer? On the final? I don't remember how many. I think it was like five. Oh my God. Is that the same night as on the regular time? No. Oh. Yes. That's it's longer than a regular like, exam. It's about double the length of a regular exam. You can do like that Wednesday. What if you like recorded the lecture and you can watch it ahead of time so you have more time? Time. And then you can do like the review. <laughs> I know, I'm kind of scared for final because I was thinking like, I don't know, like, I'll think, about it. I'll think about it, I'll stuff. think about it, I'll think about it. Honestly, just review Monday, do Monday and Wednesday review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to learn to learn the weekend? Honestly. Okay, here it's out. Don't even cover chapter 11. Okay, I'm like, oh. Yeah, we're going to see how much we can get through. We're going to see. Um, but it is like double the length of a regular exam. That's but the good thing, but the, I think it's a good thing that it's cumulative because because then you have then you you have those simpler questions that aren't <laughs> no, like, no, there are no simpler <laughs> questions. <laughs> but you'll still have exam resources just like you had on all the other ones, you know. So you have all your formulas, you have all your. No, it doesn't matter. All right. It's not all formulas. <laughs> it's not all formulas. I wish it was all formulas. But a good, a good way to review. So that's kind of the question, right? What's a good way to review? Y'all know what? At the end of every chapter, there are those discussion questions, right? Those are really good places to go and see how you're doing. If you didn't know this already, the answers to those discussion questions are at the end of the book. But if you look at the question and go, eh, I think this is the answer, and then go check in the back, did you really help yourself study? No. So what I would do is if that's what you're going to use as a study tool, you get like a blank sheet of paper out, right? Jot down your answer. Like, what do you really think the answer is? Don't go to the back of the book yet. Go into the chapter and check your answer. Because then you kind of like look at the material around that. Then go and check it at the back of the book. You know what I mean? Those are good. So the summaries at the end of every chapter are really good, but those are two good places. Okay. Oh, like not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So last time, last time we talked about 
right? How disaccharides form, right? And how to, how to name them and how to name the glycosidic linkage between those individual monomers, right? Well, if you can create disaccharides from monosaccharides, what can you also do? Create monosaccharides from disaccharides, right? So you're having a hydrolysis reaction going on, right? So all you do is add water. And when you add water, what happens to your glycosidic bond? You break your glycosidic bond, right? Okay, so um, this, is, this is important for the body. If you think about everything that we eat has different kinds of sugars inside of them, right? So what kind of sugar is in milk? Lactose. Every single disaccharide has a unique enzyme that will hydrolyze it, right? Because enzymes are super specific for their substrates. So in most people, as we get older, the enzyme that hydrolyzes lactose, the expression of that protein goes down. So what does that make us as we get older in general? Lactose intolerant. And so, and so um, that's exactly what you see in, in most of the population, but there is a small subset of people who live in, I should have looked this up before I came to class, but in like Iceland or I don't know, New Zealand, someplace like that, where they have been drinking milk as adults for a really, 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 really long time. And so their expression actually doesn't change. So people in their population do not become lactose intolerant. But for the rest of the world, we haven't been doing it that long. And so, and so our expression does um, generally decrease, right? Um, so you have to think about what's gonna happen um, with the things that we consume, right? So when you eat things that contain sugars, we want to break them down into monosaccharides and we're gonna use them for energy, right? So what pathway are we gonna study next? Why do we care about sugars? Glycolysis, right? So we are actually gonna look at glucose and see what happens as we convert glucose basically to energy. Is that the only source of energy that we have in the cell? No, we have some other sources of energy. Fats are sources of energy, right? So you can have triglycerides. This is basically how our body stores um, energy in terms of like adipocytes and things like that in the form of triglycerides. Now triglycerides can then be metabolized through a completely different pathway in order to generate energy, right? But the one that we are gonna focus on today is glucose. All right, um, oh yeah, yeah. And this is what we talked about, right? We talked about um, um, lactase being expressed at high levels in our infants. And then as we get older, we don't express it anymore, and so we can't digest it, right? Okay, but we already talked about that. But you can um, you can buy milk. You don't have to take the, the, the pills, right? So if you're lactose intolerant and you still want to drink milk, you can do one of two things. You can buy milk that has already have an added enzyme that is lactase that breaks down the lactose into glucose and galactin lactose, but it tastes a little bit different because each one of the sugars binds to the GPCR receptors a little bit differently. And so you get a different taste. But so if you want to still drink milk um, and you don't want to drink milk that tastes funny, then you take a supplement that has the enzyme in it that will break down the lactose. So don't cry over spilled milk, right? Okay. Ready for glycolysis? Yes, you got this. You got this. You completely got this. All right. So before we start like on all this kind of stuff, I kind of want to just kind of just want to talk a little bit, right? Okay. So we have glucose. We want to eventually turn glucose into what? No, like at the end, the end of the story, ATP. Like the very end, right? Okay. We're gonna first talk about glycolysis. So what part of this entire pathway is gonna cover just glycolysis? Well, we're gonna convert glucose first to 
pyruvate, but not one pyruvate, two, two. So this portion is glycolysis, just that portion. And that's what we're gonna cover today. The next chapter, once we have pyruvate, pyruvate can then enter the mitochondria. So glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, but we generate ATP in the mitochondria. So we gotta to get to the mitochondria. Glucose can't enter the mitochondria. So we have to convert it to pyruvate. And then the pyruvate is gonna be converted again and we'll eventually be able to enter into the mitochondria. Once we're in the mitochondria, what process is gonna happen? Before the electron transport chain, citrate. Then once we're in the citrate cycle, now we can go on to the electron transport chain, the ETC. That's the end of the semester. That's where I want to go with this semester. You got this. <laughs> you got this. So, so this, is, this is basically our complete oxidation of glucose all the way into ATP, right? So you're not just going to make ATP. What are our other products from this entire pathway, we, what do we call this entire thing? No, cellular respiration. Okay. The, the reverse is true for plants, right? Plants take energy in the terms of sunlight and go to glucose and that's photosynthesis. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so we're going to focus just on the very, very beginning of this. We're going to focus just on glycolysis. So glycolysis, oh, I think I need to go up. So glycolysis is glycolysis, right? So we want to split one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. So if you look at glucose, how many carbons do we have in glucose? Six. How many carbons in pyruvate? Three, and we have two molecules, so that gives us six carbons. How about oxygens? Six and six. How about hydrogens? Twelve and six. Okay, so we're losing what? Hydrogen. So what's happening? Oxidation. Okay, you, you have to be able to look at that stuff and recognize those patterns. So in glycolysis, in this process, right, it's really 10 steps. We're showing one arrow, but it's 10 steps. There are two stages to glycolysis. One of them is an investment of ATP, right? So to make ATP, we have to use some ATP. So that's the first half, the first five. In stage two, we're gonna produce ATP. So in stage one, we're going to consume to ATP. In stage two, we're going to produce four ATP. What is my net to ATP? Where was this process happening? Cytosol. Do we have oxygen in the cytosol? No, we do not. So this is the primary pathway for ATP generation under anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic meaning no oxygen. Why would we need this? What? Name one cell type that won't be able to go through citrate and Electron transport chain, super common in your body, super, super common. They know? One that does not contain mitochondria, right? Mitochondria is where we have oxygen. So do you know of a cell type that has no mitochondria? Red blood cells. So this is how red blood cells make all of their ATP, right? You can also um, go through this if you're under general conditions where you don't have a lot of, AT have a lot of uh, oxygen. Right, and we'll talk about some of those um, examples later. But you made two pyruvate. These two pyruvate 
um, are precursors for citrate, sure, but that's not the only thing that they can go and do. You remember the forest, right? So they can be shuttled off to different places and do different things. So I don't want you to think that the only place that pyruvate can go is the next step on this chain. It's not. It can go off and do other things. And we're not really gonna talk about those other things. You have to take biochem too for those other things. So cool, so cool. Don't you know, y'all can make me sad. <laughs> you teach biochem too? I do, I do teach biochem too. I love it. <laughs> you should talk to you should really talk to some of the some of the biochem two students if you're thinking about it. Um, if you send me an email, I actually talked to a couple of them, and they said they would honestly talk to y'all without me in the middle, right? Because I'm always going to say biochem two is amazing, and everybody should take it. But <laughs> but if you send me an email, I'll send you their email, and they said they'd be happy to talk to y'all. So if you're thinking about it, you should. All right. Um, so the place that pyruvate is going to go for our, our purposes today is that it's going to go eventually through the citrate and then through electron transport chain to make ATP, right? So when you go through the mitochondria, you're going to make ATP with ATP synthase. So it's a particular enzyme that makes ATP. Do you need that for these net two net ATP? No, we're going to use glycolysis to make them. So this pathway is super insanely highly conserved. What does that tell us? It's very important and it's very ancient, right? It's been around for a really, 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 really long time. If it's in bacteria and it's in us, you know, that's a pretty good length that it's, it's important and it's been there a while, okay? So it's really, really, really important. So what we're gonna do is we're first gonna watch a little animation that's gonna give you an overall overview of glycolysis. So what do we have to think about in terms of um, the energetics of a reaction happening or not? Delta G, we need to worry about Delta G. So what is delta G dependent upon? Yeah, all those things, but we're basically going to be at standard conditions, right? Pretty much. So if I calculate a delta G mathematically using all the standard conditions and I get a delta G value, is that the delta G value in the cell? Why not? It's not. Why not? It's all about concentration, all about substrate concentration. So if we link all of these reactions, right, all kind of together, as soon as one reaction happens, the product from that first reaction becomes a substrate for the next reaction. So it depletes the product of the previous reaction. And then we can drive things forward and we can change that delta G value to make it um, go from being negative to being positive. So when you look at, I'm gonna skip ahead and come back. If you look at our standard conditions, you're gonna see some values, but this is just mathematical values. What we really wanna know is what's happening inside the cell. And that's this last column, okay? So be careful when you're looking at Delta G values. If we're at standard conditions, this is not really what's happening in the cell. It's really this column, okay? All right. So I wanna, oh, I gotta go to my animation. I'm like, where is that? Here we go. Glycolysis is a metabolic Sorry. pathway that converts one molecule of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate and generates two net molecules of ATP. The glycolytic pathway, consisting of 10 enzymatic reactions, can be divided into two stages ATP investment and ATP earnings. Stage one requires the investment of ATP to generate phosphorylated compounds. These will be metabolized later in stage two, generating ATP. In the first reaction, hexokinase phosphorylates glucose using one 
AT field. A second AT field is used for a phosphoryl transfer reaction catalyzed by phosphofructokinase 1. The resulting six carbon structure is then split into two three carbon products at the end of stage one. Early in stage two, we see the first of two ATP generating steps because two molecules of three phosphoglycerate are produced for every glucose molecule. This step provides ATP payback that replaces the two ATP molecules invested in stage one. In the final reaction of glycolysis, pyruvate kinase catalyzes a second substrate level phosphorylation, producing pyruvate. This step provides the ATP earnings in glycolysis by forming two net ATP molecules. Metabolic pathways are regulated by both the availability of substrates and the catalytic activity of enzymes. One way to understand how a pathway is regulated is to examine the free energy changes for each reaction, identifying steps that drive the pathway toward product formation. Reactions with free energy values close to zero are reversible. They are characterized by enzymes that operate at full capacity, so the direction of metabolic flux primarily depends on substrate availability. Reactions with highly negative free energy values are considered irreversible. They are usually subject to enzymatic control. Okay, I want to pause it there. They are usually subject to enzymatic control. So those first enzymes that we talked to, that they showed, right, that had a slightly positive or a slightly negative delta G value, really close to zero, that's how we control delta G by controlling substrate concentration. But can we control substrate concentration and change this reaction? No. So how do we control enzymatic activity? Allosteric regulators. Some of them can be inhibitors and some of them can actually promote activity of an enzyme. But it binds at a place other than the active site, changes the conformation of the protein. So you have basically an active protein and an inactive protein, depending on what it's bound to. And that will change the catalytic activity of the enzyme, right? Those are our two major mechanisms for how enzymes are regulated. Like this stuff never goes away. <laughs> In glycolysis, three reactions are highly exergonic with large negative free energy values. These are the reactions catalyzed by the enzymes exokinase, phosphofructokinase 1, and pyruvate kinase. These are really important ones. Reactions that are essentially irreversible in metabolic pathways are called rate limiting steps because enzyme activity can be regulated to be low even when substrate levels are high. Rate limiting enzymes serve as regulating valves, shown here as narrow bottlenecks that are opened or closed in response to cellular conditions. In contrast, the wide regions represent unrestricted reversible flow through the pathway. We can compare glucose degradation via glycolysis to glucose synthesis via gluconeogenesis. Glycolysis and gluconeogenesis utilize the same enzymes for the reversible steps, whereas irreversible rate limiting steps require pathway specific enzymes to control metabolic flux in the appropriate directions. Okay, that's that's really, really important. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to cover gluconeogenesis very much this semester, but all of these places where we have enzymes in glycolysis that have those massive negative delta G values you're not just going to turn that reaction around. So, and, and the other thing is you don't want to, you don't want to, you want to be able to commit to one pathway or the other. And so the way to get around that is to make everything in here reversible. And then at the places where we have basically those irreversible reactions those rate limiting reactions, we stick in an enzyme that will go in the opposite direction. Right? And we'll have a large negative delta G value. And these will therefore be irreversible. Right? Okay, I think that was it. I don't think he says anything else. Yeah, I didn't interrupt him too much. Okay, so let's go in and let's look at these reactions. 
right? Okay, so here's our big overall picture, right? When we have glucose come in, we're gonna go through, first step is what? Glycolysis, right? Glycolysis is gonna make us two pyruvates, right? I really hate that they don't put that there. But you make two pyruvates. Now, you can make lactate from pyruvate why would we make lactate? What conditions might we make lactate? Anaerobic conditions, so like you work out a lot or something like that, you, you don't have the oxygen even in the mitochondria to make ATP, so you make lactate and then you can keep going through glycolysis and you can make two ATP. It's something's better than nothing, right? Okay, so that pyruvate will eventually get converted, get pumped into the mitochondria and get, get, get converted into acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is our entry molecule for the citrate cycle. There are two places that we can get acetyl-CoA. It doesn't have to come from glucose. What if you go on a low carb diet? What's your body gonna do? Break down fats instead and convert those fats into acetyl-CoA. Now that you have acetyl-CoA, Acetyl-CoA is kind of basically an intermediate molecule between glycolysis and the citrate cycle. So now that you have acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA can enter the citrate cycle. And in the citrate cycle, you're gonna generate a little bit of ATP um, and you're gonna generate these energy carrying molecules, NADH and FADH2. And you'll see in glycolysis, we also make some energy carrying molecules as well. These are the transition molecules between the citrate cycle and the electron transport chain. So between each of the three different cycles, you have an intermediate molecule. So between glycolysis and citrate, it is acetyl-CoA. Between citrate and electron transport, it is electron carrying molecules like NADH and FADH2. They're not the only ones, but, right? So everything that occurs here is aerobic. So you have oxygen present, right? And so once these energy carrying molecules go and hang out with the electron transport chain, right? The electron transport chain is just multiple proteins embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. We can pump hydrogen ions and our pumping of hydrogen ions allows us to run this ATP synthase molecule that generates a crap ton of ATP, okay? So this is, this is where you get the majority of the ATP out. Glycolysis only gives you a few. Okay, here's glycolysis. These are all the steps in glycolysis, all the enzymes, all the substrates, and all of the substrate um, uh, molecules. Why can't I think of some words sometimes? I don't know, right? But in our investment phase, what's really important to notice is that what you are doing in the investment phase, do you see how you go from glucose to glucose six phosphate? What do we do? added a phosphate, right? Now glucose to fructose, well gosh, glucose and fructose had the same C6H12O6, right? It's still a 6P, so we still have the same amount of phosphate, so do we use up an ATP? No, like you can look at the names and understand what's going on, and I'm gonna teach you how to do that. So then, so that's really just an isomerization. Oh, look at this, phosphoglucoisomerase, huh, huh. Pretty neat. Okay, now when you go to fructose six phosphate, you go to fructose one six phosphate. What does that tell me? Just the name, don't look at the structure. What's the name? I have two phosphate groups, one attached to carbon one, one attached to carbon six. Oh, so I attached an additional phosphate. So what did I need to invest? An ATP, what kind of enzyme phosphorylates? A kinase. And what substance am I phosphorylating? fructose. So, well, so I'm phosphorylating fructose with a kinase. Phosphofructokinase. <laughs> Every now and then the biochemists get it right. <laughs> Every now and then. Okay. So now that you have fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, right? I mean, we have two. Now, oh, why do we have this weird branch? This is the point where we cut it in half. When we cut it in half, we actually get two different products. 
we get glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydrohydroxyacetone phosphate. This is not a good substrate for glycolysis. We can't use it. So if we can't use it, we need to change it with an isomerase, right, into something usable. How many carbons are in this unusable cleaved form? Three, so it's a triose. So it's a triose and it's phosphorylated, triose phosphate, <gasps> isomerase. <laughs> All right, so then we go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So what happened here? No, we're actually, look what's coming. Well, okay, so you're, you're adding an inorganic phosphate, yes. You've got, well, here you're adding a phosphate. You have it, it's a dehydrogenase. It's, so it's a dehydration reaction, right? And we actually make, look at this, NADH, one of those energy carrying molecules, right? So now we go from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate. So what happened here? I released an ATP, which means I took a phosphate from my sugar, from my triose sugar, and plunked it onto ADP, right? That's a substrate level phosphorylation event. A substrate level phosphorylation event is when we make ATP. You're gonna read that in the book quite often, right? So that's when we're making ATP. So if we're gonna make ATP, we're gonna put a phosphate on something. What kind of an enzyme puts a phosphate? A kinase, right? Substrate level phosphorylation here and here. Okay, so then we go from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. Oh, the phosphate's just on a different carbon, right? So that's a mutase. Okay, then we go from 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate. And we released an oxygen. So we're going we're gonna to look at that reaction. But then we go from phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate. We went from a phospho to no phospho. So where'd the phospho go? To ATP. And we do that with a kinase. You could tell a lot about the reaction just by the names. Okay, just by the names. All right. So when we're looking at all of these different steps, what's really important is to look at the most important steps. So what are the numbers of the rate limiting steps in glycolysis? What are the numbers? One, three, and 10. I don't know why that changed color. Okay. Um, what about reaction seven? I see reaction seven has a negative 18. Isn't that pretty good? Right. We're not looking at this column. This column technically doesn't matter. What matters is going on in the cell. So this is really relatively close to zero. So we don't worry about it. It's not, in, it's not that we don't worry about it. It's that it's a small delta G, and so it's a reversible reaction, right? Okay, so tell me something that's in common about our three um, rate limiting reactions in glycolysis. They all do. They all do something. They're all in, involved in moving a sub, moving a phosphate group whether it's consuming ATP or using ATP. There is only one reaction that is not a rate limiting reaction that produces ATP, right? And that's number seven. So there are commonalities that you're gonna see and you can use that to make predictions about the reactions. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through one step at a time, one at a time, right? So. We're gonna go through phase one first, step one, right? Step one is our investment. So how much ATP do we invest? We invest two. Why are we investing two ATP? We need the phosphate group from the ATP to phosphorylate our substrates, right? 
So why? In our very first reaction, um, you have two different enzymes that will catalyze this reaction, either hexakinase or glucokinase. Um, and the two are different depending on what cell type you're in. So if you're if you have if you have hexakinase, hexakinase is basically present in everybody. So all cells. Glucokinase is only present in pancreatic beta cells, C -R -E -A, pancreas, and in the liver. And that's going to be really important later. So look at glucose. Which carbon are we going to phosphorylate to get to our product? Carbon six. So we're going to call it glucose six phosphate. And that phosphate came from ATP. So we convert ATP to ADP, right? What are the properties of the phosphate group? Like it's what? Somebody said it. It's negatively charged. That is really, really important because how does glucose get into our cells? In general, like all cells. It's diffusion. Sometimes it's facilitated diffusion. There are a couple of different kinds of types of diffusion depending on the cell type and all that kind of stuff, but basically diffusion. So if the concentration of glucose gets high enough inside the cell, it could diffuse out. Is that what we want? Oh no, oh no, that's our, that's our energy source. We need to keep it. So to keep it, to pull it, put it in your wallet, right? And keep it, you have to phosphorylate it. Because once you phosphorylate it, it becomes negative, and then it can't go through that facilitated transport mechanism. So it basically locks it in the cell. Now, I want you to remember your enzymatic catalysis background that you, you're so good at now, right? <laughs> okay, so if I have these phosphate groups that are negatively charged, and I want to transfer a phosphate group onto a substrate, what do you think has to be present inside of that enzyme in order to stabilize my intermediate to phosphorylate the substrate? Something positive, something positive to shield the negative. In this case, it's magnesium, right? So now do you see why it was so important that you learned Enzyme catalysis mechanism is going to be important. You're going to use it all, right? Okay, so that's our that's our very first one. Um, yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about the two different kinds of of enzymes that catalyze this reaction before we go on to all the other reactions, right? I told you there were two different enzymes. Hexakinase is in all cells or in just pancreas? All cells. All. This is pancreas liver. I want to talk about the pancreas. What does the pancreas make? Insulin. All right. So let's think about this. The difference between hexakinase and glucokinase. Hexakinase can be feedback inhibited. Feedback inhibited. I am. Woo. Can be feedback inhibited. Glucokinase cannot. Why is that important? When do I want to make insulin? Anytime I have a high enough blood sugar level. So if glucose 6-phosphate would inhibit glucokinase, then my pancreas would basically stop responding to glucose in the bloodstream. Because how does that, so how does the pancreas do this? I guess, I guess that's something um, we, didn't, we haven't really talked about. You eat, right? You get high, I'm not even gonna spell it out. You get high blood sugar, right? Okay, so what does your pancreas do? Pancreas picks up glucose, right? We have glucokinase. So glucokinase will convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, right? Now, if I were in any other cell, I would have a feedback inhibition, but I'm not. I'm in the pancreas, so I don't have feedback inhibition. 
So I'm going to go through all of the process that we talked about, and I'm just going to shorten it and I'm going to say I'm going to make ATP. Right? So ATP is another inhibitor of a lot of different places in this pathway, but not in the pancreas. So if we get a high enough level of ATP in the pancreas, what's gonna happen is that you're going to um, inhibit, John BIT, inhibit, why is inhibit hard for me today? Uh, potassium channels. Potassium channels control calcium levels. CA2 plus levels in the cell. Makes then our page, right? So if I have lots of ATP, I'm going to inhibit these, these potassium channels. The potassium channels um, will then have an effect on the calcium levels. It's like this, you know, this cascading event, right? And so eventually um, what's going to happen is that because of high levels of calcium, you get fusion of vesicles with, um, with our hormone insulin and the insulin goes to the bloodstream. I know, it's too many BSs. <laughs> All right, so do I want this pathway to stop while well, I still have a high blood sugar level? No, as long as I have high blood sugar, I want to be pumping insulin into my bloodstream. What about the rest of my cells? The rest of my cells, once I have enough energy for my cell to function, basically the pathway is gonna start backing up and I wanna inhibit the pathway because I don't need it anymore. Then I can go, the body is designed to store energy, right? Because we, our bodies are designed to like go through winter and use up all of our body fat. We don't do it anymore, but you know, the body doesn't know that. And so it's gonna go and make fats and store fats for us for later, right? We don't need them, but it will do it. Okay, so, so that's one way that they're different. Now, this graph is talking about what property of our hexakinase and glucokinase. So we're concentration versus reaction rate. What can we derive from this kind of a graph? KM and KD, right? We can look at how much, what's the binding affinity of hexakinase versus glucokinase. Here's our normal blood glucose concentration. So do you notice that if you get a little bit of glucose, hexakinase is so super happy, right? It is rocking and rolling. What about glucokinase? It takes longer. It takes longer. So you have to have a sustained um, high enough blood glucose level in order to make insulin, right? Just because you eat a little bit, do you want to produce a lot of insulin? No, you want it to be proportional to the amount that you have eaten. Well, look at that binding curve. That's perfect. But in all other cells, if you have glucose in the bloodstream, take it in right? Phosphorylate it, keep it. But here you want the amount of insulin release to be directly related to how much sugar is in your blood. And that's exactly what happens. So glucokinase is very, very similar to those glucose monitors that we talked about whenever, <laughs> earlier in the chapter, right? So, so this is the manual way that we do it enzymatically, but this is how our body does it. Glucokinase is kind of like a sensor for our bodies. K, KM is, our, is, is the concentration, right, at which you have a 50% of the Vmax. And from that, you can drive your KD. So do you need a lot of substrate to make hexakinase work? <laughs> 0.1 millimolar. How about glucokinase? You need how much more? A hundred times more. A hundred times more. Okay. All right. 
So now back to back to the train, right? Um, so our reaction to we've made glucose six phosphate, right? But we have an isomerization reaction that's going to occur, right? We go from glucose six phosphate to fructose six phosphate. So our phosphate isn't changing. What's basically going to happen is that your ring is going to break open. Remember, we said that the sugars exist in ring and stick forms and they're at an equilibrium, right? So they're opening and closing all the time. It's not a big deal. But they're going to open one way and then close a different way, right? So now, do you see how the left hand side of this molecule, we're going to try and turn the right side into exactly the same thing so that then we can cleave it in half and have two equal parts. That's basically what's happening in glycolysis. All right. So we've turned it into fructose. So now we have that carbon that guess what the next reaction is going to be. We want to phosphorylate it, right? Okay. So this one is just an isomerization. So you have a phosphorylated glucose molecule that we isomerize into fructose. Yes. Okay. Now, third reaction, phosphofructokinase 1. We have a phosphorylated fructose molecule, and we're going to phosphorylate it with a kinase, right? So if we're going to use a kinase, we need ATP. So we have our fructose 6-phosphate, and in place of the hydroxyl, right, we're going to get rid of that hydrogen, and we're going to attach our phosphate group to it. So now we have fructose. And remember, if you ever forget where you are on the ring, if I want to find carbon one, what do I do? What do I look for? Carbon attached to two oxygens, which is my anomeric carbon. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start numbering them, right? OK, so we don't number this guy anymore because he didn't come from the original ring, right? So we're going to label this one, oh no, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So we have a phosphate on one, we have a phosphate on six, yeah? So what kind of a ketone or an aldehyde? Ketone, ketone, okay. So now we have a just about symmetric molecule, right? So now that we have a symmetric molecule, we want to cleave it. So we're going to cleave that with an aldolase. Remember those aces? Those are the ones that are going to the chop things, right? But once we do cleave it, so basically what's going to happen is you're going to have one cleavage event that's going to occur in order to linearize the molecule, right? So it's going to be between that carbon um, that participated in the carbonyl and then the oxygen that was on the penultimate carbon. And then you're also going to cleave it such that you get three and three. So I got one, two, three. So I want another cleavage event here. Four, five, six, right? So then I get one, two, three, one, two, three carbons. But are these two molecules exactly the same? What's different? Where the carbonyl carbon is, right? So here it's in the middle carbon, here it's on the end. Well, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is a substrate that our bodies can use in glycolysis. So this molecule can proceed straight through glycolysis, but this one can't. So we're going to have to modify the dihydroxy um, acetone and turn it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay? So we have a particular enzyme that can do that, and that is triose phosphate isomerase. So it takes a triose, which is a three carbon molecule that has a phosphate attached to it, and it will isomerize it, right? So there's an intermediate, right? This is reversible. It's a completely reversible reaction. This is not one of those high energy um, reactions. So just remember that those, that's why we always see those as double arrows. And we're going to make another molecule of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So once we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's the end of our investment phase, right? So how many ATP did we invest? Two, right? So in order to make two, 
we're going to actually have to make four. And remember, every reaction from here on out, really it's times two, right? Because how many molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate do we have? Two. Okay. So we have glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So what you can basically do is put a two in front of it, right? We're going to add a phosphate to it, but we really need two, right? And through glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase, we are going to make one three bis phosphoglycerate. So which carbons have the phosphate? One, one, and three. One and three have our phosphate. So we are actually going to make two NAD and two 1,3-bis phosphoglycerate. And these two NAD are really, really important um, in cells that don't have oxygen, right? Because they're gonna have to do something with, with the end products of glycolysis. And so it, it gets really important, um, but not so much for glycolysis. Okay. Reaction seven, phosphoglycerate kinase. We got a kinase, what's gonna happen? If you have a kinase, you're going to do a substrate level phosphorylation and you're going to make ATP. So really we have two 1,3-bis phosphoglycerates. So we're going to make two ATP and two 3-phosphoglycerates, right? You really need two ADP, but you know, right? Okay, so we produce two ATP. Where are we net right now? We're net at zero. So that's not going to work out for us, right? So why are we making all these different weird sugar carbohydrate things? What's the point? We're going to make some really high energy molecules, molecules that have more energy than ATP. And when we make those molecules that have more energy than ATP, they're very, very, very unstable. So they're not going to hang around very long, but we can harness their energy and use them to make ATP, which is a more stable, but yet high energy molecule that the cell can actually use. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the meaning behind the reactions. So the next one is just a mutase because we need this phosphate group to be on the central carbon right here. So all this is, um, is a, a movement of our phosphate group. So we're not investing anything or making anything. Then our last, um, our last, or our, our second to last, um, we have a dehydration reaction that's going to occur. So in dehydration, what do you make? Water. So we have a hydrogen here. We have a hydroxyl here. These are the ones that come away. And when those are lost, what do we make? A double bond between our two carbons. And we only have two hydrogens attached to our carbon. So these are high energy molecules. These are very unstable molecules. So in the very last reaction, we can take the energy in those unstable molecules because really how many did we make? Two. So we need two ADP, two ATP, and we're gonna make two pyruvate. So we were able to use a little bit of ATP, make some super unstable carbon molecules, transfer that energy to a couple of ATP and still have substrate left to go into citrate and then electron transport chain so that we can make more ATP. This is a super efficient process, super amazingly efficient. All right, I think that's the end of my time, right? Yeah, it's a good ending point. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good weekend. Yes. So overall, you're making two ATP, two and more. So watch. If you want to know everything that you need, I think the table is a really nice place to go. Um, it's not the water is not so important, right? Don't try to keep track of the water. Try to keep track of ATP. Try to keep track of energy carrying molecules, NADPH those things, right? Yeah, you got this.
You got this. It's not so bad. If, if you if you read the names, you know what's going on. You just have to like stop and think about it a little bit. Retracing my mind back to file once we got. Yeah. Yeah. So they cover that a little bit, right? They cover it a little bit. File one sixty-five. I feel like we do it a little bit. Well, we do like the photosynthesis part one fifty-six, right? Yeah. So similar, but not. And then I feel like we did it again in micro. Oh that's yeah. Only ones I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know if you're So you so you did this? Yeah, like six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're see you're an advantage to everybody else in the class because most no. people haven't seen it at all. <laughs> I guess so. you're doing like one from six, like you said. If you see it, but you don't, I did not at this level. Like so just saying like Here's the steps. Here's what you make at the end. Like, but that doesn't help you if you don't understand why it's happening. Like, you're not going to remember it if it's just a bunch of steps. It's a lot yeah. of I didn't get that. Yeah. That's all they gave me. They literally said, here's what it makes. That's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to build. You got to build, right? We're, we're, it's a building thing. All right. Let me, let me end the Zoom.